60 in the Old Testament, and I'm going to skip some chunks of it just to make it more manageable. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in the span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had greaves of bronze on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, Today I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, took the provisions, and went as Jesse had commanded him. He came to the encampment of the army as the army was going forth to the battle line, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage, ran to the ranks, and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before, and David heard him. David said to Saul, let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, you're not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him. You're just a boy, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord, who saved me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor, and he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these. I am not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the creek, put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came and drew near to David with his shield-bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, 
But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistines drew nearer to meet David, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, striking down the Philistine and killing him, for there was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine. He grasped his sword, drew it out of its sheath, and killed him, and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. This is the word of the Lord. And we all know this story, right? We heard it in Sunday school. David was a little boy and Goliath was a giant and he got him with a slingshot right in the head and the Philistine fell over dead. The only lesson you can teach little kids with that is don't throw rocks. I have several scars from being hit with rocks, so I, I could, we could talk about that. Well, let's look at this a little more closely. Let's take Goliath of Gath. He is the champion of the Philistines. Now, the Philistines, we learned in social studies, are the friendly Phoenicians. They live in Lebanon. They, they're seafaring people. They sail all over the place. They're the ones who wrote the first alphabet that became the Latin alphabet. These are nice people. And they have five cities to the south of Lebanon in the Gaza Strip. And Gath is one of those cities. Goliath, a Philistine, is also a giant. The text we just read in the King James tradition says that he was six cubits and a span tall. That would be something like nine feet. That's a big fellow. The earliest Hebrew manuscripts have four cubits and a span, which is more like six, nine. Either way, he's much taller and bigger than anybody else on the field that day. He's a terrible foe. And twice a day he steps forward out of the Philistine army. And twice a day he taunts Israel and challenges them to send their best warrior out to fight him. And the winner takes all. If I win, the Philistines will conquer you. And if you win, we will be your servants. And everybody is afraid of Goliath and no one will take up the challenge. But he doesn't simply challenge the Hebrews. He stands there and makes fun of the God of the Hebrews. Our gods, he says, the gods of the Philistines are many and powerful. Your God is just one lonely God all by himself, and you can't even see him. He doesn't have a lot of power. What a lousy God you've got. And Goliath goes on like that, you know, for an hour at a time cursing the Israelite army by the Philistine gods and ridiculing the Lord God. This causes the Hebrews a lot of anguish. But no one will step forward to fight Goliath of Gath. And along comes David. Three of his older brothers are in the army, and he is sent to bring them food and to find out what is going on and bring a report back to his dad. And he hears Goliath taunting and blaspheming the Lord God. And he says, who's going to fight this heathen? 
If nobody else will, I will. Samuel says, you can't. You're only a boy. You haven't been trained as a soldier. You cannot go up against the champion of the Philistines. And there's no way that a boy could defeat this mighty and fearsome giant. But David isn't afraid. He's fought lions and bears, killed them when they attempted to steal a sheep. He's taken the sheep right out of the mouth of the lion and grabbed it by the jaw and flipped it over and killed it. He's not scared of lions. He's certainly not scared of Goliath of Gath. So Saul says, well, okay, let's see how this works. And gives him armor, but it's too big and too heavy. He can't wear that armor. He can't even walk in it. So he takes it off, just takes a few stones in his bag and goes forth to answer Goliath. And Goliath sees him coming. This boy carrying a sling, no armor, no sword, and Goliath laughs. What? You sent a, a, a boy after me with a stick? Is that the best you can do? Is that the best the mighty Hebrew army can do? The all-powerful Hebrew God can do? And Goliath laughs. And then David says, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And he goes on and specifies how it will happen and what will happen to the Philistines. And everyone will know that the Lord God is the one true God. And then David swung his sling around and shot him, hit him right in the head, and he fell over dead. Right? That's what we all learned in Sunday school. Well, that's what we learned in Sunday school. But, but, Philistines wore helmets that came down to here. So there's no way that the rock hit him in the head and killed him. Commentators are always geniuses. And one commentary says, well, obviously his helmet fell off when he laughed. And he wasn't even worried enough to put it back on because this kid was just a kid, just a boy. And others say, no, well, he wore a helmet, but it was a different helmet from what everybody else wore, obviously, and it had a space there where the stone could hit him in the head. My own mother said, well, no, the stone hit him in the temple, which is much more vulnerable spot to hit him don't hit people with rocks in the temple, son. And I said, yes. A couple of commentaries suggest that the word for forehead in Hebrew, you know, Hebrew is written with these weird characters that are the consonants. And then you put these little dots around them to make the vowels. And so a different dot literally changes the word dramatically. Well, the word for forehead in Hebrew is only used once in the Old Testament. It's right here in this chapter. And it is different from the word for greaves, the thing on his legs, by one little dot. And that word is only used once in the Bible, right here. So there's no real way to compare the usage and learn anything. It is possible, then, that the stone didn't hit Goliath in the head, that it hit him and fell down and got lodged in his armor, in his greaves, and tripped him up. And he fell down with all this heavy armor. And while he lay there, David came up and took Goliath's sword, cut off his head. You can believe any one of those you want. I think whatever you believe, you need to realize David manages to kill the champion of the Philistines with a rock. And the Philistines basically said, if this boy can kill our champion, what will happen to us? And they turned around and they ran all the way back to Gath. 
And the Israelites chased them and killed a lot of them and won a great victory for the Lord God. Well, the boy David kills Goliath against all odds. And he didn't do it by might. He didn't do it by cunning. He did know how to use a sling pretty well. But it happened because the Lord God was with him. When David was anointed, the Holy Spirit came on him and stayed with him. And when David heard Goliath blaspheming the Lord God, he was affronted and said, I don't care who this guy is, no one talks that way about our God. And God was with him as he made the decision about what armor to use and what armor to wear. And he wasn't afraid. David has here, and throughout his life, has a profound sense of the sovereignty of God. God is in charge. God is in control of whatever happens in this world. If God wills it, it will happen. So whatever God's design is, no matter how mysterious, it will come to pass. Now that does not mean that everything is determined and it doesn't matter what we do. God uses our choices and we have real choices. But in the midst of those choices, God is at work. So that whatever we choose, God can you know, manipulate things so that his purposes come to pass. Because God is sovereign. And David believes that and knows that some way he will defeat Goliath because Goliath is wrong about God. And we need all kinds of Goliaths in our lives, don't we? Some of them are internal. You know that commercial that says, to most people, I look like most people? And then the woman turns out to have fibromyalgia. I think that speaks for a lot of us. A lot of people have Goliaths that are internal and can't be seen. Depression, anxiety, physical pain. But you would never know that to meet a person. Many years ago, Bette Midler recorded a John Prime song and in the introduction, she told a story about a crazy bag lady who walked around with a fried egg on her head. And she ended the introduction saying, well, we all, some of us wear the fried egg on the outside. And some of us wear the fried egg on the inside. But we've all got something. And some of those somethings are so huge and so frightening it's as though Goliath were standing in front of us, roaring and laughing. So when we see Goliath coming, when our demons attack, when that internal private pain gets us, we're overwhelmed. But if we focus our attention on God, and at times that is very hard, but if we do it, we see that the Goliath is not so huge and terrible. Now, I'm not recommending that you go off your meds. <laughs> I am suggesting God will help you stay steady and help you cope. The German preaching professor Rudolf Boren wrote that after his wife died, he suffered for months with a terrible depression. He didn't know what to do to climb out of this depression. And someone suggested that he come and sit with them as they worked to memorize the Heidelberg Catechism. So he did that. And he said, you know what, it helped. And he began his climb out of the depression. The first question is, what is your only comfort in life and in death? Part of the answer is that I, with body and soul, both in life and in death, am not my own, but belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood has fully satisfied for all my sins and redeemed me from all the power of the devil, and so preserves me that without the will of my Father in heaven, not a hair can fall from my head. 
Warren said as he memorized that first question, he could feel that he was getting better already. Ernest Gordon, who wrote Through the Valley of the Kwai about his experiences in World War II, uh, much later in life gave a lecture, and I heard it. He said that memorizing scripture somehow helps people with mental health issues. He couldn't prove it scientifically, but he told a lot of anecdotes. Focus on God and the pain lessens. Focus on God and Goliath doesn't seem so terrible. Well, other times, Goliath is something outside of us. We worry about whether we'll have enough money to pay our bills or to last through our retirement or will we outlive our funds and our family? Who will take care of us? I might lose my job. We worry about the IRS. We worry about our health. You know, that little pain I've been having. What could that be? We worry about all the ways we might get hurt. We worry about how much we worry. And here, of course, focusing on God and praying helps. But sometimes you have to act, too. If your car is stuck on the railroad tracks and a train is coming, you can pray all day long. But it'd be much better if you get out of the car first, right? We have to do what needs to be done when we face these Goliaths. Just as David put a stone in the sling and threw it. But remember that God is always with you. When he faces Goliath, David puts his trust in God. God will not fail him. And God will never fail you. And even if Goliath wins, God has the final victory. And you can trust God from that. The Goliaths of this world will never defeat the Lord God. Jesus was asleep in the stern of the fishing boat. The storm threatened to swamp the boat. And these professional fishermen who'd sailed on that lake every day of their lives were terrified. And they wake up Jesus yelling, we're about to die. Do you even care? And Jesus stills the storm with a word and then asks them where their faith is. No matter how fierce the storm, no matter how tall and ugly and threatening the Goliath is, God will be with us. God will take care of us. So we need not be afraid. We go into this world in confidence without fear. You see, the worst thing that Goliath can do is kill you. And for those who believe in the promise of God and Jesus Christ, even that is not so scary. So go into the world. Do not be afraid. The Lord of hosts is with you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Uh -huh.